Hello and welcome. Today I am joined by Dr. Nigel Jones, who is a sport and exercise medicine consultant. Nigel, I saw you yesterday on site at R4P, which was which was great to see. So thanks for giving me more time today. Yeah, no problem. Nice to uh, nice to see you again, Andy. So whereabouts are you today? I am at the what is officially known as the National Cycling Centre today, but what everybody knows as Manchester Velodrome. So the yeah, the headquarters of British Cycling are at Manchester Velodrome. And, you know, as you know, I'm chief medical officer for British Cycling and have a mixed clinical and non-clinical role within that. And yeah, today I'm at the yeah, today I'm at the Velodrome. Right. So what would a typical day at the Velodrome consist of for you then? Um, a combination. So, so yeah, my job is part time um, rider, so athlete facing and part time management governance strategy. I sit on our senior leadership team for the Great Britain cycling team. So it can be a whole combination of things. I've had a couple of meetings this morning, been down to track to speak to the riders who were training today, been over at the MIP because our medical facility here at the Velodrome is currently being upgraded. And then I'm back here now, obviously, to speak to you and I'll be checking in on the riders on track later on uh, before I head home. Right, so it's quite a long, long day at the Velodrome then or? Yeah, but, you know, listen, I always say we're, we're very lucky, aren't we, to do the jobs we do. Those of us who are lucky enough to work in elite sport um, need to embrace that privilege. And, you know, if you want... If you want a nine to five job Monday to Friday, then elite sport isn't the the job for you, is it? Never has been, never, never will be. Yeah, no, no, definitely. Definitely. So whereabouts are you from originally? And I'm interested to sort of know how you got into this this field. So born in Liverpool, but as a family, we moved around quite a lot up and down the country for my dad's job but came back to medical school in Liverpool in 1985, qualified in 1990, uh, so a good while ago now, and always had a real interest in sports medicine. But of course, back at that time, there wasn't a formal training programme in the specialty. So the way you got into sports medicine was either through general practice or alternatively through orthopaedics or maybe accident and emergency. So I qualified as a GP in 1996 and did bits and pieces of sports medicine along alongside being a full time GP partner for a number of years. And then in 2004, the RFU set up the National Academy, the Rugby Football Union, and advertised for a 50% full-time equivalent role as doctor to the National Academy. And at the same time, probably you, you may remember, there was a big explosion in musculoskeletal assessment services at that time. And, um, you know, there was three-year waiting lists to see orthopaedic surgeons for routine outpatient appointments, etc. And our local primary care trust, as they were called in those days, was looking to set up a musculoskeletal assessment service. So, you know, multidisciplinary team working between doctors and physios, etc. And I managed to be appointed as the lead clinician for our local musculoskeletal assessment service. And so managed to combine, managed to combine those roles and did that for a number of years. So I was with the National Academy in between England under 19s, England under 20s, 21s between 2004 and 2010. Then I got the, got the opportunity to go to Liverpool Football Club in the summer of 2010 when they had a big restructuring of their sports medicine department they brought peter bruckner in as head of sports science and medicine 
and Peter approached me about joining the team there as one of the as one of the doctors and had a great had a great three years at had a great three years at Liverpool. But at that time, the you know, the sport that really floated my boat was rugby. And, you know, I'd been a I'd been a bang average rugby player myself. And yeah, I had the opportunity to put myself in the frame for the England um, senior team job. So the England men's senior team job and was lucky enough to get appointed to that role under Stuart Lancaster and did that role with England rugby uh, through to and for a short time after the appointment of Eddie Jones as Stuart's successor after the 2015 World Cup. Over time, you know, Eddie decided to change all of Stuart's um, senior management team, me included, and I didn't get my contract renewed um with the RFU and to be honest was unsure at that time what my involvement in elite sports medicine was going to look like after that after that time but as you know there was a significant amount of turmoil uh, within British cycling in 2017 and I was made aware um that my predecessor in this role had been suspended in 2017 and the opportunity came to apply to be as it was then head of medical services for the Great Britain cycling team. Um, I threw my hat in the ring and I think they were looking for somebody with credibility and experience but who hadn't been tainted by the perceived cycling brush as it were and hence I was a I was appointed and there was a lot to do in the management leadership governance space there was a lot of improvements to be done in that space and subsequent to and I've you know and I've built a fantastic team around me we've got some great clinicians, doctors and physios working for us for the Great Britain cycling team. And then it was probably during COVID that British cycling as a wider organisation, I guess much in the same way as you, you'd consider them to the FA or the RFU, etc., decided that they needed somebody in the sort of chief medical officer space and to in the non GBCT space. And my role has since morphed into, as I say, I'm still head of medical services for the Great Britain cycling team, but running alongside that, I'm also chief medical officer for the for the wider organisation. So responsible for delivery of medical care at things like national championships, as well as for the, you know, for the Olympic focused activity that we do. So and um, that's a little that's a little potted history really um, and I've always kept up some outside of elite sport clinical activity going and I've always done that deliberately because I think if you're not careful if you work exclusively within elite sport you can get a little bit institutionalized in that environment and experience I think of working in NHS musculoskeletal or sports medicine clinic settings experience of doing that in the private sector I think it's all really valuable because even you know still now there's patients who I see outside of my British cycling work who I learn from and I impart those learnings into what I do at British Cycling and similarly what I do at British Cycling without a doubt informs and in my opinion improves what I then do for less elite um, athletes um, or people you know who, who enjoy physical activity people who I see outside of this work so I'm a great believer that you 
what makes your what makes a good job is the variety that you get within it and the um, the people you work with and so yeah as i the longer i've been here the more my focus has been around developing the staff who work in our department and you know i've seen all of them seen all of them grow and some of them move on and you know what if they move on that's fantastic if they move on to a better opportunity something different and they have the confidence to do that and they're successful when they apply i think that's absolutely fantastic i think anybody who leads a department or wants to you know wants to do that wants to keep all their staff really close to them um i think yeah i, I don't necessarily think that's the right way that's the right way to to go about things yeah, no, it's interesting. I think it was it was Phil Batty who said to me that working in elite sport was you actually de-skilled to some extent because in football he was working, seeing the same injuries all the time. Yeah, no, without without a doubt. Um, I know Phil, you know Phil, very, know Phil very well, and yeah, I would agree with I would agree with that. And I also think that the, you know, the we are working very hard to ensure that there's really robust governance structures within elite sport environments but as you know historically that hasn't always been the case and i think what working in the nhs or for private care providers does um you know and cqc status is a great you know is a great example there's obviously more and more now elite sport facilities and medical departments within clubs etc try gaining out or trying to gain cqc status and that can only be a positive thing in my opinion because it gets you to look at things with patient care at the very heart of what you do and obviously let's be honest what attracts all of us into sports medicine is the opportunity to work in high performance environments but at the end of the day where doctors or physiotherapists who are lucky enough you know we're doctors or physiotherapists first if we're lucky enough to work in elite sports environments that's that's secondary to that and you mustn't you know you must never forget um you know why why you're qualified to do the job that you that you're doing in the first place um, and the, the elite sports just a bonus on top of that mm -hmm. yeah i've never really thought the cqc within an elite sport environment so is that something that many clubs have they got that at the moment it's the direction of travel without a doubt um so it is yeah it is encouraged now that if you have a because that's the thing you know the the you're treating patients at the end of the day aren't you you're treating patients in a high performance environment but you're treating patients so therefore and what the yeah what applying for cqc status does is it makes you think you know are we really doing are we really being the best advocates we possibly can be for the for the people that we're looking after and it forces you to make sure you've got really robust policies procedures governance staff development um appraisal it, it makes sure it it makes sure that you've got all of those things in place you know whistleblowing policies um you know equality and diversity um policies all of those things that people think are on the periphery of of what they do but you know with without good governance standards at the end of the day what have you got to fall back on you know when when you're in when you're potentially being put in really high pressure environments in elite sport if you've got robust governance structures in place you can go to the person who's potentially putting you under that pressure and say look you know that it, that's your opinion of how you would like to see this situation play out but my professional governing body would take a very very dim view of that so therefore my advice is that we follow this route and um obviously a little bit of yeah a little bit healthy a little bit of healthy discussion and conflict in elite sports is 
you know, is it's to be valued and welcomed, providing it's respectful. Um, but but yeah, I think um, I would encourage all elite sports medical departments to um, to look to to pursue um, CQC accreditation. It's a really valuable yeah. exercise. Yeah, no, that's, that's that's interesting. And then, so for you, when you were starting out, then, so like you said, there, was, there wasn't really a sports medical profession at that point. What was your? Did you have a, a plan in mind, or what, what? What were your thoughts when you decided you wanted to do medicine? Um, yeah, I mean, I I wasn't one of these um, youngsters who always wanted to be a a doctor from when I was from when I was little. I'm not from a medical family. I very nearly did English, French and economics A level as opposed to physics, chemistry and biology. But once I did do physics, chemistry and biology, then I knew I wanted to be a doctor rather than a dentist or a vet. Um, and, you know, my parents were both into sport. My granddads were, you know, were both into sport. You know, I would watch as a youngster, I would watch any sport on television at all and you see people getting injured and you just you know and you wonder what happens to them and you wonder the pathway that gets them back to then performing again and that always interested me and um, musculoskeletal medicine always interested me I you know I toyed with being a rheumatologist I toyed with being an orthopedic surgeon but it was that combination if you like of anatomy um of anatomy and sport i guess that that led me to say that's that's what i wanted to do um and did it you know when you first start out i don't think you necessarily have a master plan and i don't think i don't think you know often it's healthy to have a master plan i think you know i'm a believer if you work hard and do the best job you can in the environment that you're working in opportunities will present themselves i think i think if you go you know let's be honest our world's a relatively small one you know pretty much everybody knows who everybody else is so you know concentrate on doing what you're doing and building your reputation building your expertise build your knowledge and then opportunities will opportunity will come along and um yeah i've been you know i've been very lucky in being able to work in premier league football international rugby and a major olympic sport i've been very been very lucky and i didn't wouldn't say that i necessarily chased any of those jobs but um you know and each one has presented different challenges and each one's put me outside my comfort zone you know when i first decided in 2004 you know i'd been a gp partner for eight years at that stage and the easiest thing in the world would have been to stay as a partner in a successful gp practice and stay there for the next 30 years but I knew in my heart of hearts that wasn't really what I wanted to do and hence took the risk at that stage to concentrate and do full time musculoskeletal and sports medicine and obviously I've been lucky to never having regretted that decision. Yeah, no, certainly. I think I think it's just talking about the look thing. It's very interesting. So many people that I've chatted to on this, I think the philosophy that you mentioned where you just go and do your job. And so many people have said, yeah, things have just presented themselves, right place, right time. And it's, yeah, it, it's never luck, but a lot of people like you've said it's luck because it's, it's obviously you're doing a good job and you've, you're, you're getting good credibility with your peers and that's what it's all about. Well, it is. But, and I know, you know, I know some really, really talented individuals within the world of sports medicine, you know, and certainly a lot more academically clever cleverer than i will ever be who maybe haven't had the opportunities that um have you know that, that have presented themselves to me and 
that's why you must never ever ever take any job you do in elite sport for granted um because you know a bit like the england rugby situation it can be taken away from you at at any at any time and yeah if you and i know there's lots of environments and i've seen lots of practitioners who are making decisions because they're worried that if they make the wrong what's perceived to be the wrong decision they'll lose their job and um, obviously lots of people may have worked very very hard to be a physiotherapist or a doctor in an elite sport environment but unfortunately once they get in there they then become very frightened around as i say being perceived to make the wrong decision in case they get the tap on the shoulder and says yeah well that might be your opinion but there's a queue of people you know there's a queue of people a mile long to take your place so therefore you know are you sure that's the decision that you that you're going to advise and that's that thing that's where and that's where governance that's where governance becomes your friend um and yeah you know we all know we all know practitioners in our space who've made poor decisions and paid the consequences of that with their professional bodies and you know you've got to remember that as i say you're a you're a medical practitioner first and somebody who works in elite sport second not the other way around I think, yeah, and that's, I definitely agree with you. It's, it's, I think it can be difficult because certainly within football, that's such a bubble, isn't it? And you, you're right, there's so many people that want the job. So how do you think you balance that as a clinician in that environment to be, you need to do your job first, which is about the patient, athlete, forget yeah. they're an athlete. But it is challenging because you've got a lot of politics and pressure on it as well. Yeah, and you, you, you know, if you had to sum it up in two words it would be you know it would be honesty and integrity wouldn't it because at the end of the day you know when you're you know as and when i as and when i retire um or as and when any of us retire you know how would you want to be remembered would you want to be remembered as oh yeah that's you know that's that's nigel jones he was a great sports medicine doctor well no not really you know, it would be, oh yeah, Nigel Jones, really, really decent bloke, helped a lot of people out. Um, that's how you that's how you want to be remembered. And and also I quite like sleeping well at night. So, you know, I like to, yeah, I think all of us should be able to look in the mirror at the end of the at the end of the day and go, do you know what? If if I had my time again, would I make any of those decisions differently? and occasionally of course you make the wrong decisions but i don't think you know integrity isn't something you can switch on and off you either have it as a basis for the way you work or you don't and i think if you have it as the basis for how you work you won't go far wrong um yeah people yeah i think people will respect you more for having integrity and occasionally saying no than saying yes all the time and losing that professional integrity yeah because no, people absolutely. have got to trust people have got to tr if you work in elite sport people have got to trust you to be consistent uh, because you know most most athletes who we work with are, you know they are unbelievably focused obviously on achieving what they want to achieve being the best that they can possibly be but they can also you know they can spot somebody who's bullshitting a mile off and you know there is nothing wrong with saying look do you know what i don't know the answer here but i'll do my very best to find out and we'll get in people from other environments to try and help us make that right decision but lots of practitioners in sport 
see that as showing some kind of weakness and they don't want to you know that they they want to seem to be you know omni knowledgeable to their athletes and omni knowledgeable to their coaching staff and of course none of us are and sometimes you just have to say look you know i don't know i don't know exactly how to manage this but i'm going to go away have a really good think about it seek some other people's opinions and we'll get there um, and sometimes you just got to be brave enough to say that and is that something which you like when you went into sport then having been in in, in gp practice that yeah. did you realize that quite quickly was it a steep learning curve was it it surprise you um yeah i mean the the variety of yeah the variety of people you come across in you know i think in medicine in general um, you know, literally, let's be honest, what is the appeal of doing something like medicine as a career? It's because no two patients are ever exactly the same. And that's because they're not the same person. So the say, you know, yes, they may have the same pathology or the same, you know, Physio physiological issue that you need to deal with, the same injury that you need to deal with, but they're different people and they will have different pressures and they will have different expectations of how that injury or illness should be managed. They will have different targets or, you know, how they want that injury or illness to be managed. So, and that's the, you know, that's the appeal and you know, good good sports medicine is good sports medicine, but you know, footballers are a bit different to rugby players. Cyclists are a bit different. You know, I've worked with gymnasts, I've worked with boxers, with mixed martial artists. They're all slightly different, but they're also all very very similar because they're all elite athletes who want to be the best that they can possibly be. But you've got to treat them, you know. You've got to treat them as a person who happens to have an injury rather than an injury that's attacked that happens to be attached to a person. Mm. If that makes if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, patient centered in that side. Yeah, it's yeah, but it's yeah, it's more that it's not, yeah, it's person, it's person, you know, it's person centered. You know, we're social, human beings are social animals, aren't, aren't we? And what you know for a fact, particularly because a lot of athletes have so many hangers on associated with them, it might take one, two, three consultations for you to gain their trust. Um, and it will only be when you gain their trust that you can really get to the bottom of what what their expectations are, what their targets are and the pressure that they are being put under um, and let's be honest you know the, the the vast majority of us um just wouldn't you know even if we pretended we had the technical ability to be elite sports people most of us wouldn't have the psychology to be elite sports people you know they are a they're, they're a very very special group of people and that's why i go back to the fact that we as clinicians are very, very lucky to get the chance to get the chance to work with them. I think that is underestimated, isn't it, a lot of the time? Because it's always banded around, particularly with footballers, you get a really tough rap on it where it's, oh, well, they're getting paid 100 grand a week. They should be able to deal with it. Yeah, it's nonsense. That's that's irrelevant. How much they get paid is completely and utterly irrelevant. That just happens to be the market forces for for what they do for a living you know they are the they are the great entertainers you know football is a global sport it's on you know every television in every country all around the world that's why they get paid the amount of money that they get paid they get paid the market forces the same as you know they are the pop stars they are the pop stars or the you know the hollywood actors aren't they of the sporting world it's not their fault it's not their fault they get paid as much as they do and good luck to them um and obviously being under that level of scrutiny 
you know, day in, day out, week in, way out, week in, week out, comes with a, a massive amount of potential um, angst and insecurity. And yeah, you must, you know, the fact that they, yeah, the, what they get paid is irrelevant. They are human beings who happen to get paid an awful lot of money for what they do. Um, but the start of that is the most important bit. They're human beings with exactly the same insecurities, worries, concerns that everybody else has. And if anything, because they get paid the amount that they do, there's an added layer. There's an added layer of pressure. Um, yeah, but I admit, you know, it drives me nuts, you know, but all we have to do is kick a ball around twice a week. And it's, it's just like, that. OK, you wouldn't last. You wouldn't last two minutes in that environment. Having absolutely everything you do, you know, under the under the microscope to be able to embrace that pressure and perform. I, you know, never, ever underestimate how hard it must be for them. And this is why, obviously, so many athletes really struggle when they come to retire because their you know their their whole lives have been immersed and they've committed so much into doing what they do and then eventually the time will come when that gets taken away from them and they just don't know they just don't know what to do um, yes. and you know that's an area certainly i know within sort of uk sports so within the uk sport high performance system that performance lifestyle and um, bit is is increasingly getting more and more importance uh, because yeah people need looking after you know you take something that major and significant off people they need looking after yeah well i think so like when i was growing up so it was like the football you know, i was a big football fan still am but it's like the they were big stars but now it is you cannot get away with anything whereas yeah, i would see like coming from southport you would see the everton players the liverpool players out you'd see that like, i went i was in australia 20 years ago and the for the lions tour and the rugby guys were in the nightclubs with us and that you just wouldn't really get away with that now. So it's like you've got even more scrutiny where you just because there was no Instagram, no Facebook then, where you you know you'd have videos of everything. So it's it's even harder. There still isn't any. There, there still isn't any Instagram or Facebook for me, by the way. <laughs> Very wise. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So is is there more infrastructure put in place? Do you think now? I know that mental health and all of those <laughs> things is, is more prevalent and more aware for people. Uh, is is that um do the the athletes is that taken very seriously by them as well it is and i mean i'd like to think that um and it comes from that comes from the culture of the of the environment that you that you work in and i've worked in some cultures where expressing any kind of vulnerability was seen as a massive negative Oh well, you know he, you know he's just soft. Um, whereas you know it, it, we have this expression um, at British Cycling, sort of happy head, fast legs, um, because you know we, as you know, invest a huge amount of money in ensuring we have the fastest bikes, the most aerodynamic helmets, you know, the most aerodynamic skin suits. But if the rider sitting on that piece of equipment isn't psychologically in a good space, they're not going to they're not going to ride very fast. Um, and, you know, it's OK. It's OK to have a bad training session. You know, it's not the end of the it's not the end of the world. Similarly, you know, in football, um, it's OK to have a bad game. You know, you it's what support mechanisms are in place to support you when you are going through a bit of a rough patch. You know, if you've got if you got to the stage of being an elite athlete, you know, you haven't all you, you don't become a really poor athlete overnight, do you? Um, and that's why the investment in this space is really important. And you want to create a culture whereby your athletes do come to you if they are struggling psychologically. Um, 
because yeah otherwise small problems can become bigger problems and over time will just carry on negatively impacting performance but if you've got a culture where athletes are able to go to coaches and express those vulnerabilities and just say look i'm just not in a great place at the moment well then things can be put in place to support them and when people let's be honest like all of us in all our work environments if you feel supported in your workplace it doesn't half make a difference doesn't it doesn't yeah. half make it doesn't half make a difference so why should we presume that we can just you know expect elite athletes to to perform physically and physiologically without a psychological support network wrapped in around that um so yeah and it's much it's yeah and it's something yeah and i've seen i've worked in environments where where that is very highly considered um worked in other environments where it isn't but have you seen it progressing in the 20 or plus I years so. yeah i think so yeah yeah mm. um and i think you know as more and more I think as young, you know, as yeah, those of us who've who've worked, I think the practitioners coming into into the elite sport space now are a lot more potentially aware of it than those who were doing the job 20, 30, 20, 30 years ago. Um, and I think in you know, in society in general, um there's much less, you know, there's much less stigma for want of a better word of you know of expressing of expressing vulnerability um, mm. and as i say people underestimate how hard it must be if you're an elite athlete how hard must it be every time you go out to perform you know how much is riding on that performance and how much external scrutiny you're going to be put under it's massive yeah, no, definitely. And cycling always seems to be from from the outside with marginal gains and Dave Brailsford and Steve Peters, etc., quite ahead of the game in terms of well everything, not just from the mental side, but just from meticulous in that. Is that something that you'd seen prior to going in, or like would, would you be aware yeah, of I mean, that before you? Yeah, listen, in? there's there's um, yeah the the coining of the marginal gains. Uh, phrase fair play to whoever actually came up with that to begin with because you know boy oh boy has that gained some has that gained some traction and um, but at the end of the day it's about it's about people isn't it it's about people trying to do the best job that they possibly can do and if everybody who's working in an elite sport environment just concentrates on doing the best job that they possibly can do you know it's not potentially marginal gains is it it's major it's major gains um because you know you can add up so the marginal gains obviously refers effectively to you know to kit and equipment you know have we got a bike that's you know three percent lighter than the bike that the Aussies or the Americans have got. That's the marginal gain. But the much bigger gain is are our riders fitter? Are they psychologically in a much better place? Have they got really good capacity? Can they perform under fatigue? Can they maintain their aerodynamic position as long as possible, even when under massive fatigue? You know, they're not. They're not marginal gains, are they? They're potentially, they're potentially major gains. Um, but people will only do the best job that they possibly can do if they feel supported. And if they're working with other really good people who are collaborating with them and watching out for, you know, watching out for each other. Um, it's really important that if you are in a, because it's because obviously as well as the athletes being under pressure a lot of time you know you as sports medicine practitioners are under pressure a lot of the time you've got to look out for each other you've got to be able to notice when one of your colleagues maybe looks like they're under the pump a bit and under a bit of pressure and you need to go to them and say look are you you know are you all right is there anything i can do you know temporarily i've got enough on my own plate but is, is there anything i can do to temporarily support you and and 
those human those human connections working with good people having a culture where collaboration and expressing a bit of vulnerability every now and again is encouraged and and supported that's what makes for successful sports teams the yeah, little no, the little the little one per, the little one percenters they'll they'll come and go and people will always catch up with those yeah because i think when it was clive woodward i mean he was starting off with he, he did his own version of marginal gain didn't he as well when he was doing the world cup and you were probably there around that time as well with um... no, i was that was somewhat after somewhat because obviously that was the 2003 world cup i joined the i joined the rfu in 2004 right um, so it was yeah it was provided in my role i had then i provided support to subsequent um senior team camps before i got the senior team job myself but yeah the 2003 uh, but you know they also had an unbelievably good squad of players, didn't they? Yeah, it does help. <laughs> and it does, you know, of course it does. Of course it does. Um, yeah. Mm. It, what would you say your philosophy is in terms of doing it? It's been really interesting just hearing your your approach to things in general. But it's like with now you're working at um, Rehab for Performance, which is yeah. a really forward thinking, impressive place. What, yeah. what would you say you do have a philosophy about your work? Um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's interesting. We we chatted a little bit yesterday, didn't we? Around, um, so yeah, I've got the, you know, I've got the environment I work in with the sort of um, elite sport hat on, but also outside of that, obviously, I do sort of musculoskeletal and sports medicine um, at by Liverpool and at R4P, and you know, what's life about at the end of the day? Life's about function isn't it it's about it's about physical and psychological well-being and the biggest contributor to that in people who are physically active is function and therefore i you know i think if you are a clinician working in musculoskeletal medicine function's got to be at the the front and center of all your decision making you know i get um it's amazing i see patients um and you know i'll assess them and i'll suggest um you know physiotherapy to them and they said well i've already had physiotherapy and it didn't work and when you actually drill down to what physiotherapy they've had a lot of it has been really passive um, without function at its at its centre, and you know, I yeah, to be slightly controversial, um, you know, even the word physiotherapy, uh, I think, is an interesting one because the word therapy, by its very nature, suggests something passive, doesn't it? You know, it's it's. It's I will do something to you. I will provide you with therapy. Um, whereas obviously what we should be doing in the musculoskeletal space, particularly in people who want to stay physically active, would be right. How do I rehabilitate you back to the functional level that you're looking to achieve? And occasionally you have to temper people's expectations and say look with the injury that you've had or with the arthritis that you have got and um, that's an unrealistic expectation but i guarantee i will work with you as hard as i can to get you to the best functional level you can get to and that for me is what physiotherapy or rehabilitation in the musculoskeletal space needs to needs to look like um, and one of the problems that we have of course is with the current is the way that the insurance companies currently operate and they you know they're looking to drive down remuneration rates for physiotherapists as low as they can possibly get away with and therefore what's the what's the incentive for people to go that to go that extra mile 
Um, and, you know, we have the ethos at R4P that we, you know, every patient who comes through our door, whether they're an elite athlete or they're a recreational athlete, will get exactly the same level of service. And you've seen the facilities that we've got, which allow us to which allow us to do that. Um, but not all environments can provide that. And you know what function looks like for an 80 year old patient um, who's had a knee replacement may look very different to what it looks like for a 53 year old patient who's had a knee replacement trying to treat them in exactly the same way clearly isn't appropriate and so establishing early what realistic functional expectations are and working on those that's i would say that's you know that's that's my ethos have function at the front and center of every decision that you make and whether that's but with function becomes you know comes psychological well-being as well so function in an, in an elite athlete but function in somebody who's working function who function in somebody who wants to spend time with their grandchildren you know, wants to be able, you know, do you know what? I know I'm not going to have a stair lift. I want to be able to go up and down my own stairs in my own house, you know, and that providing that is a realistic functional expectation. That's what we should be working towards and um, not. Not, you know, passive, not passive interventions. And I know it's not as simple as that, and I know I'm painting it as being black and white are very easy. I know it's not, but I think there are too many musculoskeletal practitioners who don't have function as the first thing that they think about when they've got a patient in front of them. What do you think the driver is for that then? As to why the they don't do what? that, as to, in terms of why they, why they haven't got that at the forefront? Yeah, well, I think because um, Let's be honest, all of us who work in the medical profession, whatever our discipline is, we don't like letting people down, do we? And I think um, practitioners quite often are worried that if they if they set the wrong goals, if they set the wrong expectations and the patient, for whatever reason, isn't able to achieve them, then it's going to make them look bad. But of course, the whole thing about functional rehabilitation and functional goal setting is you can adapt it as you you can adapt it as you go along you know you don't have to be rigid um but i think some people and it's also easier isn't it let's be honest it's it's easier to have it's easier to have somebody on a tens machine in one room somebody with acupuncture needles in another room somebody who you're you know having a someone who you're taking a history from in another room. Uh, and as I say, I don't think the I don't think the remuneration model by the insurance companies um, you know, does anything to negate that, in my opinion, less than ideal practice. Because then, of course, then if you if you do come and see somebody who then says, no, I actually do think physiotherapy would really help be helpful here. That person is then, that, that, uh, you know, they're trying to push, they're trying to push water uphill from the word go, aren't they? Because people lose expect, you know, people lose experience of the treatments that they've had previously and didn't sit comfortably with them. I think it's interesting and it's not just related to therapy or, or treatments, or whatever it's like in, in life. If like if you go for an hour with Matt or whoever it is that you're in there with, you're with them for an hour, but then you've got to go and do your own stuff. You've got your own exercises and it's and at that hour is not going to solve you. It's it's well, it's a lifetime commitment, isn't it, for a lot of it? Well, it is. And that's why that's why that honesty and integrity thing is really is really important. And you know, be very, very wary of the practitioner, whether they're a doctor, a physio, a chiropractor, an osteopath, who says, right, if we do this, I guarantee this will happen. Um, and we all know that they exist out there. Um, you know, yes, the, the the language that we use 
as practitioners is absolutely fundamental to um, making people's expectations realistic. And, you know, we know there's been a lot of stuff, hasn't there, published on this, you know, um, the number of people who I see in clinic with back pain who have already been told that, you know, oh, you know, all my discs are worn. Uh, or I've got crumbling discs or I've got, you know, I've, I've got I've got, you know, loads of wear and tear in all my joints and and that kind of that kind of catastrophic language. If it's delivered by the first two or three practitioners who that individual sees that set that that's then set their expectations for, forever, hasn't it? And you, as I say, you're pushing water uphill then when you're trying to unpick that and and row back on some of that catastrophic language that's been used um, so it's around as i say it's about making your making your decisions making your language making your treatments functionally based but doing it with honesty and integrity um, and I think if you do that, you'll you'll not go far wrong in whatever environment you're working in. And I guess that, you know, and I know that that's very easy for me to sit here and say, and I know it's often more complicated than that. But, um, you know, stay consistent, stay consistent to your values, stay consistent with what you believe in. Um, and yet, you, you know, look after look after the people you work with whether it's in you know we've got a great you know all the practitioners who work in our in our full p you know we've we've in a way we've almost self-selected each other because we all know that um we're all first and yes we're all you know we'd like to think that we were all good clinicians but we're also all good people we're also good people um and as i say that goes up and that that I hope comes across. So when people come into our environment, as well as hopefully going wow at the facilities we've got, they also go, OK, here's a bunch of individuals who are clearly all working collaboratively, who all know what they're doing and who will all put me at the absolute centre of what happens to then get me back to the level that I want to get back to. And that's whether they're, you know, that's whether they're Premier League footballers or they're, you know, recreational weekend cyclists. Mm, no, it's great. I think it's really good. And it's great to see facilities like like that one going up with with a really good team. And uh, so last question, you're you're a thoughtful kind of person. So I'm intrigued as to what you do. Do you, do you read any self-development books? I'm always looking for tips on any professional books or anything that you recommend? Um, yeah, do you know what? I, um, I'm i much more of a believer, to be honest with you, in, um, you get, in my opinion, you get much more from um, spending time with your family and your mates um, as you do with reading, um, any books to be I've read a lot of them and yeah there's little snippets that that might resonate but I think you know all of us work in high pressure you know in high pressure environments and do you know what the the when I'm not at work the last thing I want to do is read a book telling me how I can be better at work to be honest with you I'll you know I love spending time love spending time with my family I love spending time with my friends um you know this weekend for example um you know my eldest two um children are 27 and 25 they both live and work in london they're both coming back you know they're both coming back home for the weekend they're, we don't see them very often but they love spending time back at home and you know what i mean that's what yeah the last thing i'll be doing over the easter weekend is reading is reading a uh, yeah is reading a book giving me some tips how to be better at work yeah spend yeah. time spend time in the fresh air spend time with your family and your mates you know we're very lucky as you know i live in formby and and i've got a you know i've got a, a dog walk that i do 
you know, at least four or five times a week down through pine woods along the beach back up you know and that's my that's my that's my self-help that's my that's my therapy yeah no no sounds good well hopefully there won't be too many people there that are coming for the bank holiday at that so it's a popular spot it is a popular spot but obviously it's not my spot so so there is ju- they're just as entitled to be there as uh, just as entitled to be there as i am and you know it's good now i love to see you know i love to see i love to see I love going into, you know, I love going into the centre of Liverpool. I love going into, you know, sometimes you need a bit of peace and quiet, but sometimes, you know, you like to feed off the vibrancy of living near a major city as well. Um, because as I say, we're we're social animals at the end of the day, aren't we? And that's why we need to look after each other in whatever environment we work in. Absolutely. Look, Nigel, really appreciate your time on that. Have a great bank holiday weekend and yeah. I will uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, likewise. Um, no, th- enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the chat, Andy. Um, thanks for your time and I'll see you soon. Good, man. Cheers, Nigel. Thanks. Cheers.